Hello, everybody. Hello. Hi. <laughs> I'm Dan Donegan in the English department. Thank you all for coming. If you were my students, uh, thank you for listening to me. And if you're someone else's students, thank you for listening to them. Uh, a very big night, uh, yet another big night for the English club. I'm uh, Dan Donegan in the English department, and I'm faculty advisor for the English club, a, a small but mighty organization always looking for new members. And uh, we are putting the final touches. We're actually just waiting to get back this sh uh, the next issue of Eastern Exposure, Campus Literary Magazine. So we're hoping if there's one more event of the English Club this semester, which would be a release party, so you may see signs about that. Uh, this will certainly be the last uh, visiting writer of the semester, and it is Harry Humes. Before we get to that, though, I just want to say thanks to uh, some people who made it possible. One is, is BAM, giving us uh, the money for the honorarium, a very generous gesture and support of the continued good work that the English Club has been doing uh, for uh, the last couple of years, uh, earlier certainly, but especially over the last couple of years. Uh, thanks to Ken Bedini, Vice President of Ac uh, Student Affairs, who provided uh, housing accommodations for uh, Harry over the last two days. And uh, finally to the English Department, who uh, funded the meals uh, that Arias had and the dinner that he just had with students. So without all of those things coming together, it could be uh, it, it wouldn't be a, the wonderful event that it is, so, so thanks to all of those people. And uh, I want to embarrass, it's become my ritual up here to embarrass um, English club officers. Holly Gonzalez, who I'll say in a minute, is sighing, and, and that's kind of become customary. I would just, uh, the English club, you know, you, as a faculty advisor, you come in and you say, wouldn't it be great to be in charge of an organization, you know, of students who are self-motivated and who, who um, believe in, in bringing writers to campus and and uh, who want to host poetry slams and want to have bake sales and want to do book sales and do all these things um, as a way of, of creating you know, funds and resources in addition to what you get from BAM to, to make uh, cultural events possible. So the English Club is really a direct extension of, of what the, the mission of the school is in terms of furthering the liberal arts and the relationship between the disciplines. And uh, the English club, sometimes uh, there are clubs and you do events that are important to that club and it's great to that club and um, English club is that too. But it seems every event and every undertaking the English club takes on um, adds significantly to the culture of the school as well. So I want to just um, acknowledge the hard work of the current executive board and that is Andrew Garaventa, our president. Our tireless president, yes, save your applause till the end. Somehow you knew that in the end, I appreciate that. Uh, Holly Gonzalez, if you can stand up. Thank you very much. She's our vice president, Amanda Nagel, our tireless secretary, and is Jason, Jason Hershkovitz uh, on a research assignment? I, I believe so. Anyway, but can we have a round of applause for the current e-board? <laughs> and I thank you guys very much as so many things. You can sit down now. So many things go into bringing these events, and you come into so many roadblocks, and you plow through them, and you go with the meetings, and um, as I said, you're really at the mercy of students as a faculty advisor. And these three people, uh, in addition to Jason, and the rest of the people in English Club, and the, the incoming e-board, whom uh, I, I guarantee will keep this good train going down the tracks, are really motivated and brilliant and smart and caring and it's terrific. It really is a, a wonderful duty to take on. So thank you all very much for that. Um, okay, now to our main event, as they say. Uh, it's my distinct pleasure to introduce to you Harry Humes, and by extension, his wife Nancy, who's back there, that's, uh, who has come up with him uh, on this trip from their home in uh, Pennsylvania's Lehigh Valley. Harry Humes was born in Gerardville, Pennsylvania, which he affectionately refers to as, quote, a small rundown coal mining town in Schuylkill County, end quote. Like many towns throughout the anthracite coal region of the eastern United States, Gerardville revolved around the coal industry. Harry's father, brother, uncle, and cousins all toiled in those dirty and dangerous mines. Harry uh, got out of Gerardville, served in, in the Army, and then enrolled at Bloomsburg State College, which became Bloomsburg University. And he began as a business major, uh, a uh, trivia question, uh, trivia, what, fact, uh, trivia answer, something to do with trivia, that he shares with Dr. Taracchio, who also started as a business major. I started as a physics major, which is why we have readings in the science building. 
Uh, and he later switched over to English when he came to his senses and studied with a poet and scholar named Richard Savage. Uh, he went on to earn an MFA in creative writing at North Carolina Greensboro before moving on to become a professor of English at Kutztown University in Pennsylvania, where he taught creative writing and American literature from 1968 to 1999, and where he also founded and edited a really terrific literary journal named Yarrow, which, and he did this great thing. Uh, literary magazines, you're searching for an identity, and what are you besides just you know, another place that tries to publish the best work you can publish? Well, he would do this cool thing. Uh, there'd be one issue a year that was a general submission policy. He would take the best poems that he could find. And it was, and he's just a, a really good reader and a really good editor, and it was a very small magazine, so it was always chock full of good poems. Well, the second issue of the year was always a featured chapbook with a particular writer that Harry wanted to introduce, uh, sometimes young and emerging, uh, sometimes maybe established writers, but introduce to, to uh, the Kutztown community in general, but also to, to a larger audience. And he would do an interview, an in-depth interview with the author, which would be in the book, and then it would be sort of a new and selected poems uh, that Harry would choose or that the poet would choose, they'd work that out. And I found those invaluable resources, as I was Harry's student at Kutztown. And coming across those issues of Yarrow, looking at the magazine and reading the poems and, and those general issues and saying, wow, you know, these are, there's a lot of things to learn from here. But also reading those interviews and, and studying the craft of those other writers and then looking at the poems in the same edition with the interviews was, it was a gold mine for me when I was starting out. And I know I'm not the only one who, who feels that way. So in addition to his, his wonderful and storied teaching and editing career, Harry is the author of 15, 14, 14 books of poems. And uh, just to give you the, is, what do you appreciate, you know, who we're dealing with? So let's see. There's uh, The Way Winter Works. There's the video camera. We can have that. Gorse Cottage Poems, uh, Poems About Ireland. Ridge Music was an AWP finalist. Uh, the Weather of Surprises, Grounded in Nature, po a chapbook of, of poems about the coal region, Robbing the Pillars. Uh, his first book, and if you look at the photo from 1982, he hasn't aged a day. I believe Harry has made a deal with the devil. And it's a good deal because he's a good person. I don't know if good people can make deals with the devil. I don't think so. Maybe it's just good genes. But this is a book called Winter Weeds, published by the University of Missouri Press, and it won at the time what was uh, perhaps the most distinguished uh, poetry prize you could win. Is it just a first book? Was the Devon's just a first book prize? Yeah, it was a, a very, you know, it's... If it wasn't first, it was tied for first in terms of the, the preeminent first book award to win the Devon's Award. That's just that. If he just had that, and that's a storied career. But we go on. Throwing Away the Compass, published by Silverview, Silverfish Review Press. Uh, Evening in the Small Park. Uh, Tent Sleep. And Pennsylvania Coal Town, which is a really interesting book of uh, Harry's poems about the anthracite coal region, an interview, as well as photographs. So... That's terrific. Uh, many of you have studied this with me, a book called The Bottom Land. And uh, then there's August Evening with Trumpet, both by the University of Arkansas Press. A Butterfly Effect, which won a 1998 uh, American or National Poetry Series publication. Which, and that's a big deal. If that's all he had done, that would have been terrific. Um, and 14th, but no least, or what, most recently, we'll just leave it at that is uh, Underground Singing. This is a chapbook of poems that won the 2007 Keystone Chapbook Prize. And uh, I, was, I came across this review of this book, and I thought it was really insightful, and I wanted to share a little bit with you. Uh, it's described as a book of mysteries set in a place with a mythic yet all too real underworld that swallows men alive and recreates the, itself in the tunnels of their lungs. It would be easy to focus just on that darkness, I'm sure, and to neglect the singing and Hume's right as often of the nearer dark in his family's dirt cellar, not to mention the hills and rivers beyond. Perhaps the greatest mystery of the book is how, in a mere 17 poems, uh, how a mere 17 poems so full of hesitations and uncertainties can conjure up so complete a world. And uh, a couple other words of praise. Uh, esteemed poet, critic, translator Bruce Weigel said of, of August Evening with Trumpet that at the heart of Harry Hume's best poems here and elsewhere, is a boldly human way that he walks through and inhabits the natural world. He never personifies there or falls for the pathetic fallacy because he knows enough to allow the beauty of nature to emerge fully in all of its dangerous and harmonious ways. This is enhanced by the ease 
with which the poet collapses time into an immediate temporal reality where the past is only a blink of way and the future all around us, hovering like promises that we must keep. This new book is marked by a clarity of words and a purpose that shimmers and a stubborn and elegant insistence throughout that good words spoken well matter in our lives. Uh, Harry's poems have appeared in, in nearly every significant literary journal in this country and in Canada as well, uh, including the Gettysburg Review, Poetry, Poetry Northwest, Salma Gundy, Shenandoah, West Branch, Prairie Schooner, Tar River Poetry, Virginia Quarterly Review, to name only a handful. If you're a writer in this room and, and you aspire to, to publish, all those journals I just named, you know, ending up in, in one or two of those uh, is a significant accomplishment in your life. And that's just, the list is about this long. And what I just read is about that long to give you some idea of uh, Harry's uh, accomplishments. Other awards beside those I named for book prizes, uh, he won Poetry Northwest Theodore Repke Prize, and uh, he has received the National Endowment for the Arts Poetry Fellowship and several Pennsylvania Council for the Arts grants. And on a personal note, I'd just like to add that I have read and admired Harry Hume's poetry for over 20 years. My mother read it to me in my crib. Uh, yeah. No, that's not true. <laughs> but the admiring part is, is very true for over 20 years now. Each time I come back to it, I marvel at the ways in which the speakers in his poems present themselves with such great humility and incisive vision into the essential conflicts pushing always at our hearts. Rarely are they at the center of the poem. Rather, Harry has them intentionally stand off to the side and present to us a moment that we will instantly recognize as essential to understanding who we are, even if we've rushed past similar ones all our lives. Whether they're observing a deer or a fox or a mink or a sparrow or a summer spider or his wife dancing through a field of sunflowers or they're contemplating fog or the Grand Canyon or a house tenuously settling above an abandoned coal mine or the little Juniata River and its promises of trout, or they're bringing to life for us the people of Girardville, and with them, their terrors and their beauties, their lessons and their dreams, and their quiet and continuous perseverance. The speakers in Humes' poems continually search for new and deeper ways in which they, and by extension we, can experience the myriad joys, hardships, and duties that make up our lives. So please join me at welcoming Harry Hughes. He's some guy, that Donnie, I'll tell you that. Thought he'd never ended, huh? Glad to be here. Um, never been up in Connecticut. Well, I passed through Connecticut, but I've never stopped this long in Connecticut. I like it here. I like it here. I like your school. Um, I want to thank all of you for coming and all the people whom Dan mentioned that I can't remember all your names in the English club and so forth. So, so thank all of you. And after that big buildup, I think I just better start reading some poems, don't you? You know, and somehow justify all that stuff he said about me. You know, so. And I'd like to begin with a poem um, called The Snowy Owl. It's a poem, it's a short poem, I don't know, 15 lines or something like that. Um, it's a poem that seems to g gather two of the landscapes that I like and have tried to recreate for many years now. One is the Anthracite region where I grew up, and other, the more pristine and clean, where Dan and I took a walk today, my wife, and, and uh, um, I was gonna say his wife, but she was teaching while we were out playing in the woods. So. Um, where we walked, it was just green and it was stream and a nice trail and, and Pennsylvania offers the same thing. And uh, it's funny, where I grew up is a little town called Gerarville and it, the, the valleys up in that part of Pennsylvania are very, very severe. The mountains come down very quickly and there's a narrow shelf in between where the towns get scrunched up, you know, and the coals in, in this particular valley and they, they scoop it out with seam shovels or, or they dig coals, right? Tell them my father was a deep pit miner, right? So. Um, Right next to it was this other valley, which was just day and night. I'd walk across this mountain, you know, and I'd go down, 
And here was this lovely trout stream, you know, with trout in it, of course, uh, and farms and stuff like that. So here side by side were the two parts of my life that I was going to inhabit for a long time. Uh, and this poem called The Snowy Owl seems to pick up on that a little bit. And so my poems, all the time I've been writing art, sort of set in that, in the Gerarville setting, the coal mining setting, and the mine, my parents, my father, the miner, uh, or in, in the other, the nature end of things. Um, my town was, it, it was, it was uh, everything was covered with coal dust in it, you know, the streets, you never got clear of it. My mother was constantly dusting and sweeping off our, our concrete stoop in our fancy row home <laughs> on Main Street. Um, trucks are rumbling through, trains are going by, um, miners' faces were black from the mines, you know. They had blue and black coal scars, so it, it, it was this weighted darkness there, typified by the blackness of the coal dust and that sort of thing, right? So, so that's here in, in his poem, that sense of that ever-present um, thing pressing down on you. Uh, you knew you had to get out sooner or later. It was that of mines or get the hell out. And I got out, I got out, as my brothers did too. So, so into that pristine, in that dirt, not pristine, this pristine bird, for inexplicable reasons, flew one fall, late fall, into a coal bank at the end of town, a black coal bank with this white owl. And they're, they're, they're birds of the tundra, far north, and they're big. They're significant birds, and they're beautiful. You know? uh, they are beautiful. Uh, but you know what men do with snowy things, they're white things, don't you? you know? They love killing white deer you know, or white whales. English professors have made a fortune talking about the chase for the white whale in Moby Dick, for example, you know, so. Uh, so those two things. So it's a kind of initiation into what happens when something beautiful turns up in this valley that isn't beautiful, okay? Uh, and it's a kind of initiation. I didn't think of it at the time because I was pretty young, but over the years, it, I finally got around to writing this poem and I began thinking of what was going on there. So um, I'll read it now. It's called The Snowy Owl. We saw it first, big and white, on the spill bank near town. Then the others came, old Parnell talking about its whiteness, such an easy target. All afternoon, that great head made a weather we'd never seen. Then feathers flew up, and Parnell sent his son up after it, carrying it home, head down, wings worthless, and the whole autumn changed suddenly, as if someone had told us a story of going away. That last line has uh, become significant in this poem for me because I think, as I was telling, talking to um, uh, Dan, um, <laughs> my brain, I wasn't drinking at dinner either, you know, so. Um, but about how the, uh, I read somewhere that the story is always old and always sad. And it's always a story of going away. I didn't know that quote. The story's always old and always sad, right? And so that last line is if someone had told us a story of going away, but that's the story we know. We come here, we inhabit this body for a while, and then we go away, you know? And it's kind of scary to think about, but, um, and it just, I don't know where that line came from. It just happened. It just happened, you know. So, so uh, the next poem I'd like to read is uh, something called The Photograph uh, of my father uh, and my brother and myself. Um, and it's in three parts, but I'm not going to, um, to mention the, the one, two, three. I'll just read it. My father, he must have been about 40 then. He looked in pretty good shape. He died, by the way, of uh, not an accident, but of coal, uh, black lung, you know, that the lung disease. And, uh, but age 62, age 62. How about that? Maybe it is Easter 1940. He has my brother in one arm and me in the other. There are some swings in a pigeon coop in the background. He has been coughing for days into his red flecked handkerchief and his breathing sounds like sleet against the window. I think of him folding his napkin neatly into his lunch pail, 
then rising on thin legs and walking down a gangway through the dusty air. Do I hear him now at the front door, then the back? Does he climb the side steps and knock softly on a window? I don't know. In the photograph, he seems like a man thinking of nothing but holding his two small sons. <laughs> There's a poem called River Vows, and I wrote it to celebrate the, uh, the wedding of Dan and Karen Donaghy. I wasn't going to show it to them, but I thought, oh, that's not bad, Humes. You know, that's a pretty decent poem you wrote there, you know. So, pretty good, pretty good, boy, you know. Um, and there's a, dedica a dedication line for it. I think this was published in The Way Winter Works. I think it was in that volume, as I recall. So um, it was published. Uh, the wedding happened along the Hudson, across from West Point, in a little desanctified chapel. It was just beautiful, you know. And well, I'll read it for you. Even in rain, who would question the clarity of this day, the plucked notes of the harpist and the old chapel itself, with its four Doric columns, big doors, spare wooden seats, snug and easy on us as such a place ought to be. And outside flowed the river, thick currents, gulls, swirls of mist against the mountain, and me suddenly thinking of the bass and pike out there, it was nothing of disrespect or boredom, but as always, just the lure of the water and what hid underneath. There's more. The same is with words of love or any blink of an eye in which something rises, a look, a touch, and casts over us what is unseen, irresistible, that we long for all our lives long. So that's for Can. Dan and Karen. So. I remember when I was a kid and, and my father would drive up to a town where my mother's sister lived in a railroad town about two hours away. It was a beat up old Chevy we drove in. And, and I was always asking him, every time we drive over a stream, I'd, I'd ask if there was fish in it. He used to get so pissed off at me. <laughs> Will you stop it? There's fish in all this water. You know? Except in the Black Creek that flowed through Girardville, there was nothing in that except rats and dead bodies once in a while, you know. So. <laughs> <laughs> and this is a poem I call My Wife Vanishes, who's back there, uh, in a field of sunflowers. There was actually a field of sunflowers. Um, I don't know where we were going, but there was many fields, a huge field, huge fields of sunflowers. And it was spectacular, spectacular. It was just, just great burst of yellow, you know, it was great. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> And I think we might have been going to an amusement park. So, but this is the poem that came out of it. And as you, I think, what a lot of poets have to learn is, uh, you're writing the poem, but you have to give your imagination room to take off. You know, you have to get a little nutty in poems at times. You know, you can't pull back and say, "Oh no, that's not nice," or "Oh no, that's a little unusual." You know, but you want to be unusual. You want to be different. You want to be not nice at times. Not this is a very nice poem. This is a loving poem. This is a very decent poem. A Methodist poem, you might say, even, you know. So <laughs> I grew up Methodist, you know. So. I bailed out early though, I'll tell you that. So <laughs> my wife vanishes in a field of sunflowers. In this warm evening of cowbells and cicadas, she kneels for a little while by fever few and ladies' bed straw, then moves in an easy curve past grapevines and bloodroot and into the sunflowers, the whole field closing around her. She has taken off her sneakers and jeans, hung panties and bra and blouse on the wooden bench, her arms flashing in and out of the first few rows, the giant heads trembling above her. It is all I have of her for hours as I wait by the hickory, imagining her spins, the spider webs, trailing across her face and shoulders, her breath like good weather down the rows. I grow nervous for her, that she will lose the horizon or vanish into one of the sinkholes or move into another field and then another. I want to call out to her, but do not, trusting as I do her instincts to keep this or that leaf in mind, to remember the light as it unwinds behind her like a thread, 
I think of taking off my clothes and following of our small house beneath the honey locusts, the evenings of red wine and Vivaldi. I watch for early constellations whose names I do not know. Until at last, until at last at the corner of my eye when I have been looking elsewhere, there comes a paleness to the field, as though something were rising from a quiet pool by laurels. And out of it she softly steps and walks shyly toward me. A sulfur butterfly in her hair, a drift of pollen over shoulders and breasts, and one leg scratched. It could be relief or desire that makes the evening catch in my throat, or something in her face that gathers as light does along the edges of leaves in this season. Something, something that does not startle the wren, something that happens between us, a small distance we have never named. Ah, there's a poem called The Mink. You know what a mink is, I hope. It's like a weasel, like a, an otter that's in that family. Thing. I'm just in love with things in nature like this, you know, the creatures there. I admire them a great deal. This is based on natural experience. I'm a trout fisherman, so, a trout fisherman, so I, I haunt the, the beautiful rivers and streams of Pennsylvania, you know. My brother goes to Alaska and Montana, and he says, come on, Harry, I'll pay your way out to Montana, you know. I said, oh, that sounds pretty good. But I said, nah, I like my little Pennsylvania trout, you know. So he can't understand what's wrong with me, you know. Well, what's wrong with me, I love Pennsylvania, number one. I love its streams, and I love seeing things. For one thing, there were grizzly bears up in Alaska, you know. You know, and, and Montana, as I recall. And so when you're fishing, you also have to be worrying about grizzly bears, which sort of gets in the way of fishing, you know. <laughs> the mink. Head level as a snake's, its body humped up and richly brown. It came slithering down the scree. It seemed a curl of smoke in and out of the rocky shelves. Not a splash as it poured itself into the stream. Not a bubble to mark its underwater way. Then, up on the rock again, a bluegill in its mouth. It shook itself head to tail, eating slowly. Head and fins and bones, it left nothing. The afternoon was all mint and new honeysuckle as it fluffed its lush endlessness. Then gone in a dazzle of pelt, a flush of instinct, a coil of pure purpose. That's what I like about animals. They don't think they are just there, you know, and they do what they do. They do what they are, you know. Uh, no stupid poetry in theirs, always, except the way they move, you know. So. Uh, <coughs> in, uh, in Yellowstone, a number of years ago, quite a few years ago, there were these things called bear jams. Uh, the bears used to feed at the dumps. They've since closed the dumps. All the trash of the campers would be dumped, and the bears went down there, and like pigs, they gorged. And, and then they came up to the line of cars and um, with the, the, the tourists. You know, these are significant black bears, three, four hundred pounds. You know, they're pretty awesome. So, um, but they uh, they would take pictures. They would they would let the bear put its big head inside the car, the, the front window. You know, real silly shit like that. You know, just. Really dumb, you know. Uh, uh, and this is, uh, and, uh, and, and the cars were there. It was, it was a car jam as well as a bear jam. The bears were just wandering up and down. You know, da, 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 you know. uh, and so this is a poem about one tourist, very stupid man, I think, incredibly stupid, uh, who did something very stupid. Bear jam. That summer, Along the park roads, there were bear jams, clownish black bears everywhere, standing upright like men, or rolling past on all fours like barrels in a river. Little pig eyes, noses afloat in air, filled with exhaust and picnic baskets. One man coated his little daughter's face with something honey or peanut butter, and laughing, his daughter laughing at the great bear lumbering toward them, the father holding the smeared girl out before him, inviting the bear to lick. The bear pigeon-toed, spoiled rotten with handouts, closed in, its back high as the father's waist, its tongue a sickly white as it covered the girl's face, whose mouth was open, 
who might have been screaming, whose father laughed at his good fortune, until the little girl tried to get away, and the father tried to lift her back, and the bear took her between his front paws like a doll and pulled. It pulled, and the father pulled. We could see the claws against her T-shirt. Her one shoe fell off. It took no more than seconds in that day that was utterly clear, so filled with spectacle and wilderness. What true horror might have happened, but the jaws never opened wider than to let that thick tongue out and the paws that could kill a steer with a single whack suddenly let go, simply fell away and padded casually off. You didn't think I was going to kill that little girl, did you? <laughs> so you can see what I mean about a stupid man, you know? I mean, it was just incredible. Uh, uh, one more nature poem. Uh, my wife and I walked into the Grand Canyon. Once we walked a little ways and said, well, maybe we better do this next year, you know? So, um, and we did. Uh, we, Packed in. Well, we didn't pack it. We had some stuff, and then we camped at the bottom of the Grand Canyon. Went down all Angel Trail, as I recall, and Bright Angel Trail. Yeah, um, stayed overnight. It was a brutal walk. It was just brutal, you know, uh, but spectacular. Just unbelievable, unbelievable. And that's what this poem is about, you know. Um, you feel so small, you know. And I have a thing, you know. I, I, all my all of my writing friends wrote about 9/11. There's, you know, and I said, well. I was, I was not able to do it. I thought, how could you possibly, with a poem, come anywhere near? If I were, if I were Lai Po or Tu Fu, I might have been able to capture all of it in about 12 words or 12 lines. The great 15th, 14th, 15th century Chinese poets, you know? Uh, but there's no way. And the Grand Canyon is the same. It was just too big, fantastic, spectacular. Nothing but spectacle and, 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 well, I'll read it in a minute. But, uh, and I didn't write. I didn't write about it until about 20 years later. And suddenly it came out. All those years that had, this is the thing about poetry. You get an idea, something happens, um, and you, you forget about it. But the poem never forgets about you. It's always in there simmering. A slow, a slow rolling boil, perhaps. You know, something less than that, a simmer. You know, cookbooks say slow boiling roll, you know, so, uh, so it's in there, and, and then suddenly it, it's, it puts itself together, you know, and this, this came out in one sitting, this doesn't usually happen to me, and afterwards, very few editorial comments that are, are correction I had to make, uh, and it was hot that day, as I recall, no, it, was, it started out snowy and foggy, as I recall, yeah. but it was interesting, and then you start walking down, 500 feet or so, and you get beneath the clouds, and you're in a canyon, perfectly clear. Of course, you can't see the sky, because there's nothing but clouds above you, you know, so um, hanging over the canyon, the Grand Canyon. And don't mistake this with the Grand Canyon of Pennsylvania, which is a piker. <laughs> you know, we have a Grand Canyon of Pennsylvania, which is, you know, through which flows a, a trout stream, so this is the real Grand Canyon. You know, so. Down into that staggering geography, swallowed by it, Knee ache and heel bruise, the pack riding high as it's supposed to, click a rock and gravel skid a boot. It was a steady, relentless falling past skunk brush and manganite, lizards, three hours, six. The sliver of river in view, Colorado, the sliver of river in view, then out. Plateaus, spires, ravens, all of it shaped by water drip and wind soft as the drape of a sleeve. It was more than could be assembled in a brain's lifetime, such angles and slashes. He thought he'd come to the sepulchre's absence and creak. At the river, the walls went straight down like blades into that red silt. He was deeper than his father had ever got in his mind. He was digging to its end. He was digging to its end, looking for petroglyphs, for one-armed Powell. He was searching for a design. The river sucked at him. Everything rose. It was all a desert of distance and crumble. He stayed one night, then another. Rainbow trout slashed in the stream past his camp. He wrote postcards. A dark sky crackled and spun over the towers. 
It was a narrow place. It was like the neck of a bottle. He wanted to go up a side canyon to find there in a stone basin of catch water a frog the size of his thumbnail, its throat swollen with sobbing and trilling, a frog that lived an afternoon, a frog he listened down to its last note. I didn't plan it this way, but I liked the way the poem moved from that vastness and the details that I mentioned down to that, down to that tiny frog the very big to the very little at the very end. And that's what was easy to focus on. And that was the way out of the poem. You know, there's no way you can focus on the canyon as such. But the frog was there. It was small, you know. You could touch it, perhaps, if you could catch it, you know. Um, a frog that lived an afternoon, a frog he listened to down to its last note. I have no idea what the last note is, but you, it's poetry stuff, so. Fill in, the, fill in the blanks. <laughs> uh, switching a little bit here, this is a poem called Edward Hopper's Women. I don't know whether you, you should, you probably know Edward Hopper, the, the great American uh, realist painter. One of my favorites, no question, I, I love him. Uh, but as I began reading, looking at his poems, and I have the collected works of Edward Hopper, the painting, uh, I began to realize that his women were very strange, you know. All of the women are never looking at you. They're always with their back turned to you or, or giving a slight angle. But you never, they, never, they never look right at you, right at the viewer, you know? Um, and so that's what this is about. His, his women are, are nice looking, come wear hats. Even the woman in the, the famous one, um, Night Owls, I think, you know, sort of a little coffee joint at 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning. New York City or something like that, you know? And even she is somehow looking away, looking away, un unwilling to make contact, you know? The kind of a woman you'd never want to meet because you knew you'd never be able to crack any ice with her, you know? Because she wouldn't look at you. She wouldn't do anything. Edward Hopper's Women. Check it out sometime. Look at his paintings. They're amazing. They're beautiful. Um, and, and it speaks to American angst, perhaps, or... or um, lack of connection or the inability to, to c communicate or uh, I guess other things I came to think about at the moment. So um, Edward Hopper's women, looking away is what they do best. They sit in full sunlight, their knees pulled up to their breasts, and they're in bed sometime in rooms, in little restaurants, sometimes on a porch, you know. Uh, their knees pulled up to their breasts. They seem to shiver from sharp shadows on a granite wall or that train entering a tunnel. What's beyond them is hard to imagine. Enough mystery for a lifetime. You think they've missed out on everything. Not one of them is about to take a step away or scream for help. What could you possibly say to them? End of poem. What could you possibly say? Yeah. Um, you want them to do something, scream, you know, but they, they just, they just there, looking away from everything, so cut off by whatever, you know, so. Um. <coughs> uh, I was just on the side as to whether to read this one or not, but I think I will, so. Uh. Better slow down, I think we're running out of poems. <laughs> not really, I, I got enough, so. This is a poem called Lee and Melissa Always. I was uh, riding my bicycle, uh, not far from my house, uh, and the, the Interstate 78 goes right through our valley, uh, the Lehigh Valley of Pennsylvania, going east or west. You know. uh, and there's an underpass that smelled like someone had been pissing in it for like 20 years or something like that. You know how underpasses are, right? Some tin cans there and that sort of thing, you know. So, and, scratchings on the wall, you know, so. Uh, and this was on, on the wall. Lee and Melissa, comma, always. So it was punctually correct, right? Lee and Melissa, comma, always. And I thought, damn, that always is just amazing. Who believes in always, you know? Uh, and this, this is what, at 18 or so, I guess maybe we believe in that. But nothing lasts. For, nothing is for always, you know? Nothing. Uh, and so this poem is about that. It's about kind of an awakening on Lee's part. Uh, 
Melissa. Well, let me read it, okay? I won't explain it. Uh, but you see what I'm getting to, right? That, that hope one has at a certain age, that hope that uh, you fall in love, it'll be forever, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, uh, Leah and Melissa always. It begins like this. Name spray painted on a piling beneath an interstate bridge and the always they believe in and count on so much. Years of it after high school, years of it after high school, hot nights of each other, cold beers and rowboats at the lake, sand shaker from towels long after midnight. It's just always I keep coming back to. Suppose they did find it. Suppose they were out walking one day past an empty ramshackle house and suddenly there was someone hammering a sign into the brown grass that even as they watched turned deep green and the porch banister, til and the, and the porch banister nailed in place. Baskets of ferns, rocking chairs, a swing, the whole house freshly painted. They always would always be there, the salesman said putting his hammer down, reaching into his pocket for the keys, always children at the perfect age, always May or mid-June, bags always packed and in the hallway, ready for the drive to the seashore, New Jersey, no doubt. Uh, Lee, Lee, she would call out. Melissa, he would answer from the garden where he just looked up from the lettuce at some purple clouds like names. He could not quite read in the light. That's a clue there. He could not quite read the names in the light. The light just always a little too sharp for understanding any of it. What really happened, for example, that night he was out alone driving around dirt roads and blacktops taking turns too fast and once skidding into a cornfield until at last he stopped in the cool darkness beneath the bridge and with steady hands made his faithful his only mark which I think was Lee and Melissa always. <laughs> Don't be disillusioned, it's only a poem. It's not gospel, right? So. <clears throat> this poetry is hard work, and it really drains a guy. I'm thirsty, too. This is called The Relocation of Rattlesnakes. And just today, as we were walking, my wife and Dan and I, in the woods, we did see a little snake. It wasn't a, rattle, it wasn't a rattlesnake by any means, but a little snake, you know. And even little snakes give you a certain chill. As Emily Dickens says, zero at the bone, you know, in that famous uh, poem about snakes, her, her lovely poem. All, all her poems are lovely. Um, so I was thinking about this poem today when I saw that snake. So here it is, The re Relocation of Rattlesnakes. And it's, it's basically said there was a time in Pennsylvania up in the mountains, uh, oh gosh, up in, I can't, I can't even think of the county, up in Sullivan, Lycoming County, up that way, about three hours from where I live. They used to have s rattlesnake hunts every, every spring. Cell phones, I love them. I love them. I love cell phones. They had these rattlesnake hunts every year. I think it was in the fall, fall, just spring, just as they're coming out of hibernation, out of the dens. Hundreds of them come out, and a place was filthy with rattlesnake. And they kill these things. These beautiful creatures, you know, they kill them. Uh, and then years later, they decided not to kill them because it became, you know, not a very political thing, a nice thing to do. I guess, to kill a rattlesnake. So they would catch the snakes, and count them, and then release them. Right? So, uh, so that's basically the scenario here. That's what I based the poem on. So uh, this is about a town in which rattlesnakes simply vanish overnight. Friendly rattlesnakes. Once they lay everywhere, you turn over a bucket, and there'd be that cool smile, a muscular rippling through the coiled body, or beneath the porch, slats of light over a flat head with its fangs and fissures and sacks of poison. We learn how to walk lightly through the slow gathering of mottled skin, sliding soundlessly over dry leaves. They were a spell over the landscape, heat-seeking, drawn to rock outcrops that all night radiated sun. 
They stretched across hot macadam roads. Sometimes we'd find one dead on the berm or draped over a wire fence. Then one morning they were gone. Someone had come in the night with burlap bags and hook sticks and plucked them one by one. We searched the hedgerows, the hedgerows, pushed aside ferns, looked under the porch. What did we have without that slithering ease, these warnings? We'd grow heavy, careless, and into ourselves. We'd no longer gather each spring to watch them crawl out of the cave above the river. How will we sleep now that the landscape is so safe? They were a border of coil and strike we might never again cross. I think it's about two, uh, and I hadn't thought of this before. Uh, we try to make our lives so safe, but in doing so, or someone tries to make our lives so safe, but in doing so, you know, they get dull, you know? Safety leads to dullness, I think, you know? Uh, I may be wrong about that. Uh, so anyway. I didn't have that theme in mind when I wrote that poem, by the way. I just wanted to write about rattlesnakes. There's a lot of words in there. Part of the writing a poem is, of course, having uh, dealing with certain words that fit the scene, the slithering ease, for example, of the snakes, you know, and that coil, and the, the fissures, and the sacks of poison in their mouth, you know. Uh, they are uh, located on each side of the, uh, uh, they're called pit vipers for that reason, little pits above the... Uh, uh, the place where the sacks are located, uh, and other things too. And so you, you, you kind of fit the language to, to the poem you're writing, you know, um, that sort of thing. So, um, My father made bam. Sometimes you steal poems, you know, not the whole poem. Uh, you steal an idea from someone, you know. We all do it. It's a, it's a, we joke about it, but we do it. Uh, so this is a poem called My, Bo My Father Made Bamboo Fly Rods. Poets are also liars because my father never made a bamboo fly rod. So you don't always have to tell the truth in poems. Don't worry about telling the truth. Just get the poem written. Lie like hell. Or, or as one of our friends says, tell the truth until it becomes dull and then start lying. Not bad advice. And it was a, Picasso said, or one of the great painters said, I, I lie so that I can find my way to truth. Yeah. Uh, what, what truth? I don't know. Philosophical truth or a truth that one hadn't thought of before. Uh, so my father never made bamboo flower rods, but a friend of mine did. And he's very good at it, you know. Uh, uh, he was a big-time boozer and made beautiful bamboo flower rods, and I liked them, loved them. Uh, and he, he died uh, pretty early. Uh, he saw the poem. He said, hey, you stole, my, you stole me. That's not your father in that poem. This is me, George, you know. So I said, well, George, so it goes, you know, tough kid. Tough buddy, <laughs> tough buddy. We poets can be real hard at times. You know, tough buddy, tough shit buddy. I got your poem, you know, so. <laughs> I have a bad mouth. Cold crackers are that way, you know. So. My father made bamboo flower. And I don't know if you've ever held a, a bamboo flower rod. They're just, they're just gorgeous things, you know, so. Um, and he was very good at making them. But this is my, I figured too, why not make my father a maker? Because it's closer. I can deal with it more emotionally, you know in my house. I could have him go down to the cellar and come up later with the rod and so on and so forth, you know, so. And, oh, well, I'll, just, I'll read it. So. And I, I have one of George's uh, fly rods and I use it once a year. It's a ceremonial thing up on the little, the little Juniata River up around Penn State in Pennsylvania. And then I put it into its case and tuck it away for another year because I'm afraid of breaking the damn thing. Or wood, you know? So, whereas a glass rod will last forever. So. Or graphite these days. My father made bamboo fly rods. <clears throat> after he came home from his mine, after potato soup and hot, and hot black tea, down he'd go into the back cellar, combs, I should explain this. Combs are the big poles after the, the, the bamboo's been cut, like a trunk of a tree. They call them combs, you know. And they, they have to dry out before you start working with them. Uh, and then a, a certain process begins to get it whittled down to the various parts that fit the, the uh, six or seven sections of a bamboo rod. I'll, I'll start all over again. After he came home from his mine, after potato soup and hot black tea, down he'd go into the back cellar, combs, a bamboo stacked in one corner and hanging from the ceiling. 
He'd take one in his hands, check him for water stains, scuffs, scars, running his fingers over the nodes. Then with the knife and a rubber mallet, he'd split the comb into strips, his hands bleeding from the glass-sharp bamboo. Months of evenings down there, late summer into fall, fall into winter, straightening the strips over flame, planing and tapering, gluing and wrapping. One morning it would be on the kitchen table, six coats of varnish, red silk wrappings, guides and ferrule shining, three rods a year, each one with still water written low on the butt piece. When he put one into our hands, it trembled through the cork handle and seemed to want to fly off. He'd take it down to the garden to test cast, his arm hardly moving, the rod bending behind him, then arcing forward, line unwinding from a narrow loop, almost invisible against the sky, and my father telling us that bamboo was a grass and that the first bamboo rod makers also made violins. Casting to one spot, then another, as if trout were working under our mud, were feeding under our mother's peonies and sage, as if we were writing something there about his life. So you can say that. I could say that about my father, and it, it, it rings emotionally true for the poem. If I had written it about George, my friend who made the bamboo rods, you know, um, it wouldn't have the same kind of emotional appeal for me, and I, I hope for the reader. So, um, my father got to the third grade by the way, you know, and he went immediately into the mines. Not into the mines, there was something in the coal breakers that they call uh, breaker boys, where they'd sit on a little layer of, uh, they'd sit on little steps while these big uh, uh, ribbons of coal passed under them. They'd have to pick out chips, which was pieces of coal or rock. And that was their job, they were breaker boys. Their hands would be bleeding, you know, and just messed up. And, and then from there, then they went into the mines the really nasty shit, you know. Uh, so, it wasn't nice, it wasn't nice, it wasn't nice. So. It was, whatever it was. It was a town, it was a town. I mean, the mines, like, like Bethlehem was supported, Bethlehem, Pennsylvania had Bethlehem Steel in it, you know. Uh, and it was the, uh, along the Lehigh River, and it was, it was about a mile long, it seemed, you know. And it supported generations of families. And then one day it shut down. Bonk, gone gone and everything changes. So. This poem called My Ravine. If you're getting a little antsy, I, I'm about, about, uh, about four more to go. Okay, you gonna hang in? You gonna hang in? You wanna get up and do some stretch exercises? Or this poem called My Ravine. I read recently that <clears throat> cellar door as one word, cellar door, not hyphenated, but it's used as, in this case as one word. Cellar door is the loveliest word in the language. Yeah, I can buy with that. But I think ravine is way up there too. You know, ravine, that geographical landscape, or avine, ravine, ravine, coal cellar. They all, they all speak to some place that's going somewhere. You're going through a door or you're walking down a ravine or walking up a ravine. Right? Uh, so this is my ravine. This is where I want some of my ashes scattered, I think. My wife can make the trek up that treacherous uh, um, coal, coal region landscape. So. Uh, I see there are snakes in this one, too. <laughs> Excuse me, my ravine. <clears throat> you have to climb a slate wall, pulling yourself up by laurel branches keeping an eye on the ledge where copperheads love to lie in the sun. And you have to test the wall for loose footholds. And down the middle of the ravine flows a stream that sinks beneath the rocks. And if you put an ear to them, you can hear it hissing. It takes a thousand steps to the top if you go straight up, more if you zigzag past the huckleberry patches where once a black bear stood on its hind legs staring through little pig eyes, growling deep in its throat before vanishing, and not a branch trembling, not a finch or brown creeper darting off. And I don't know when I said goodbye to my ravine, whether I was 15 or 30, and what time of year it was, and if I lowered myself into the darkness of an abandoned mine tunnel that dropped hundreds of feet straight down, not even worrying about, not even worrying about the black damp, 
putting my hand against the cool walls for direction, maybe asking one last dumb question and eating a little dirt so I would never forget. I think, I think uh, what, what we write poetry to, to never forget. Milton, I think it was Milton who said, I, I, now I'm not comparing myself to Milton, not by any means, but what he said, I, li I like to think about. Milton said, "I want to write, I want to write something that the world will not, that the world will not willingly let die. I want to write something that the world will not willingly let die. It probably will let it die, but you have that hope when you write a piece that it lasts and it'll bring someone back. It'll keep someone alive. Father, me, the speaker of this poem, whoever he is, whoever he was." Uh, um, and that ending, uh, and that ending. Uh, and two, another thing I like, and I used to teach writing classes at the creative writing classes at Kutztown, where I taught for many years, Kutztown University in Pennsylvania, um, part of that system. Um, they had a hard time, I'd say, try to bring the world into your poems. Uh, if you say hate, maybe there's a better way of showing that, you know? Maybe a painted, sign or something like that, or maybe the swastika, you know? Something like that to dramatize, to bring the abstract into concreteness, to show, as they say, to show, not tell. You know, you've probably heard that many times already. So that's what I'm talking about here. To get, because we live in a world of things. We don't live in a world of abstraction. Well, we do, but mostly it's a world of things. They're out there, and you have to learn the names of things. Trees, wild herbs, animals, you know, rocks, trees, of course. A lot of things. So uh, I mentioned in this one, uh, huckleberry. We call them huckleberries, but everyone now calls them blueberries. You know, the same thing. Same thing. Uh, and uh, the two birds, I think it was a finch and, and uh, one other. Uh, yeah, a, 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 not a finch or brown creeper. Brown creeper is a little sparrow like a brown sparrow like sparrow sized bird that crawls up and down the tree. But he goes, he goes, he goes head first down the tree. Like one other bird, I can't think of. So, uh, so it's nice to know things like that, you know. So, uh, and never forget where we come from. We must never, ever forget who we were, where we came from, who was with us, our first love. I heard, I heard a, a woman say on TV, and she's nice looking, she's about 50 or 60, she said, it was one of those dumb commercials, but this wasn't so dumb when she said, she said, I'd like to fall in love again. She must have been 55 or 60 years old. You know, I'd like to fall in love with you. I said, oh, that's wonderful. I'd like to write a poem about that, you know, uh, whether she will or not. But it's, it's that sort of thing. One remembers love. One wants love, you know. Uh, or one remembers a town or a ravine, that sort of thing, you know. Uh, and you write about it. Uh, okay, I'm going to you know, shortcut it here a little bit. So. Sorry, poems. You're not getting read tonight. I'm going to read uh, three more. I'm going to read one called Late November Horse. Late November Horse. Um, and one called We Have Taken Trees With Us. And then a poem called A Great Will Know about a human cannonball. So this is a late November horse. It happened above where we live. Uh, my wife's seen this horse many times. Uh, more often than I've seen it, but this time I, I had a really close, a close encounter of the horsey kind, perhaps. <laughs> Man, that's some door, isn't it? A little noisy over there. So. I'd like to ride about horses all the time. They're beautiful, you know. By the way, I won $175 yesterday, or on Saturday, in the, in the uh, big race, you know. I had a friend. He made the bed. I just handed up the money for it. So. Late November horse. <clears throat> Big and beautiful, dark-eyed with a white blaze, he stomped the ground with the front hoof, the way a deer will when not certain of things. But he calmed at my voice and allowed me to come close and rub that flat place between his eyes. All around us, the evening was gray and hard, a wash of red low in the west. Suddenly he turned and raced up the field and over the crest and vanished. 
as if he'd found the one perfect opening to a place I wish I knew. To a place I wish I knew. And this is, um, we have taken trees with us. Um, My wife and I moved from a place we dearly loved about 15, 16 years ago now, I guess. Um, We we brought trees with us. We brought everything with us. Even the mulch pile we brought with us, you know. So, um, so this is a poem that celebrates that. Years after it happened, that happened 15, and I just wrote this about a year or two ago. It sticks. I'm telling you, these poems stick to you, man, until they finally get themselves born. Always, you know, those little jerks that pregnant women, boop, boop, boop. That's what they do. You get a poke in the ribs or a poke in the head or, you know, uh, judo chop to the throat, what have you, you know. <laughs> write me, God damn it, write me. Yeah. We have taken trees with us. White birch from a father's breath, hawthorn from a mother's red hair, catalpa with pale blossoms and leaves bigger than faces. We planted them on a sloping field with southern exposure and were less lonely because of their rustle and sway in heavy winds. Sometimes our fingers moved over red and white buds or icicles. We heard in them floor creak, water splashing a sink, Plate rattle, hymns. They were a little like boats moored to the hillside, ready to take us. And now, the last poem, The Great Will Now. There used to be these cheap carnivals that come through the coal region. You know, they were beat up and, um, but they were fun. You were a kid, and it was great. But one of these had Will Know, the great Will Know, the human cannonball. We were young Protestants, sexually screwed up, you know, Methodists, as, as Methodists will screw you up royally, you know. Um, um, and the poem's about that a little bit, you know, about we were right on the edge of puberty and dying to get into it. And, into all the glory of women and girls and Marilyn and Ruth and, and Luann and so on and so forth, you know, and we had no idea what the hell we were trying to do and figure out, you know, no idea whatsoever, no idea whatsoever, except we sort of knew, <laughs> sort of knew. And then here comes Wilno, right, this glamorous creature, you know, uh, climbing into his cannon, you know, uh, and flying every night for a week. Over two fire, over two Ferris wheels, just and landing on the net on the other side, where a beautiful girl met him in something like a bathing suit, as I recall, gorgeous, sexy, <gasps> waiting for him to come down. The, oh, the sexual imagery of this poem just kills me. I'm embarrassed by it, you know. So, oh, I don't know whether I should read it to you or not, you know. So. It's a great poem. I like it. Not a great poem. I just a poem I love very much. And I want to thank you. You're a very attentive audience. Uh, I appreciate your being here and, and uh, not running off um, into the dark night away from this stuff. Yeah. Um, so thank you very much. Uh, and this will be the last poem. Uh, the Great Will Know. And he's haunted me all these years. You know, Wilna, it's just amazing. And friends send me copies of Human Cannon, because I'm obsessively talking about Wilna, you know. They send me copies of Cannonballs I have all over my room, and, you know. Uh, even my friend of mine even gave me a bottle of wine about a female Human Cannonball. I said, oh, this is interesting. Shows are on the label coming out, sailing over a net, toward a net, a woman. The great Wilna, and thank you again. Dressed in a silver skin tight suit, he'd come out of the red and yellow tent, his cape rising behind him with each step, and a beautiful young girl in sequins holding his hand in the night that arced over the Pennsylvania mining town and walked to the flatbed truck with its mounted black cannon while the beautiful girl in tights would take his cape and kiss him goodbye as he climbed the ladder and lowered himself into the muzzle waving once to us before sinking from view, a large clock showing the seconds left before the explosion, hardly a sound in the fairgrounds, the bats in and out of shadows, and across the black creek, a child crying. And then the whoomp of it, 
the smoke and great Wilno flying out, helmet and goggles filled with a blaze of light from two Ferris wheels. We each sail over each night in a, in a week, for a week, free of us. Free of us, somersaulting among the stars high in the darkness over the valley until I'd imagine he'd never come down or land too far away to find his way back and so come to another town, become a clerk in a grocery, marry, have children, buy his own small store. And once in a while on summer evenings, but, and buy his own small store, and once in a while on, on summer evenings, run his fingers over the powder burns on both arms and hands and wonder. What are these? What are these? Yeah. But down he come to us, but down he come to us into the girl in sequins who would run to the net beyond the Ferris wheels. Down he come like a toy parachute dropped from a Piper Cub. And at the last minute, roll over in air to hit the net perfectly on the small of his back, spring to his feet, wave to us again, then do a rollover along the net's edge, a back flip to the ground, and vanish with the beautiful girl, and vanish with the beautiful girl while the rest of us turn toward home, talking about Wilno and the girl, about the red and yellow tent, about the years ahead of us, about what we were going to do. That's my tepid Methodist sex poem. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you.